Welcome to As the Story Grows. I'm Brian Patton. Today we welcome Jonah Matranga back to the podcast. Jonah's a busy guy. Iodine recently released One Line Drawings Sketchbook 1999 to 2001, a collection of the sketchbook EPs, plus some of Jonah's favorite material from that time frame on vinyl. Jonah is also the singer for Sons of Alpha Centauri, who just released their new album, Pull. Links to both will be in the show notes. Jonah talks about the innocence and vulnerability of releasing music, reflects on music as a career, talks about meeting Casey and the idea behind the sketchbook release, and more. Every time I get to talk with Jonah, it's an absolute joy, and I hope you guys enjoy the conversation we have. We've had a couple of YouTube comments recently. On Chapter 421 with Mike Maines, Nix and Mix wrote, Thank you for this interview. So good to hear about the raw humanity Mike puts into his craft. And on Chapter 482 with James Clark of Kill the Lights, Fernie wrote, The new album kills. Yes, it does. Thanks for leaving a comment. If you leave a comment, I will read it on the podcast. And I always love hearing from you, the listener, about your thoughts on the various episodes. Over on Patreon last week, I shared an audio essay about Stavesacre, their discography, and trajectory. $3 a month gets you that essay, as well as early access to every episode of the podcast and more. You can find a link in the show notes or at asthestorygrows.com, where you can also find links to the newsletter and Discord server. Come hang out. Enjoy today's conversation with Jonah Matranga. I just feel more comfortable with the guitar in my hands. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, How are you doing, man? Good. Good. I'm glad good. to have you back on the pod. Uh, yeah. How's it been? How's your life been? Good. 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 Yeah. Every, everything's, I mean, as cool as it can be, you know. I, I, hear, that. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah. How about you? Same, you know, things are feeling, feeling grateful. Certainly nothing is wrong, which is... <laughs> A good thing to remind myself of a lot when I'm feeling like something's wrong, but I just yeah. kind of check in and make sure that nothing is. And <laughs> yeah, and just uh, making music, yeah. doing the calendar, trying to live, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've noticed I signed up for your mailing list. You spent a lot oh, cool. of time like creating music for this own like pocket community. How has uh, that kind of transformed your creative process to have like it's not like a patreon but like a group of people who just are invested and you're just releasing songs to yeah i mean no it's it's exactly like a patreon really except for the fact that i was doing it way before patreon existed <laughs> yeah. um uh so i mean i've been doing always new i started it in 2000 and then did it for some years and then didn't do it for a while and then kind of came back to it the thing I love about it the most is, A, in terms of what you're talking about, in terms of kind of a rad little community, yeah. there's something just really rewarding about not feeding the streaming networks, um, <laughs> not feeding the algorithm. Like, there's no algorithm on my website. There's no, there's no data mining. There's no... Yeah. All that stuff. Um, because it's... For me, at least, as an artist, it's it's a weird feeling these days. I kind of feel like, you know, that I'm sort of here to provide content for this fucking mill. <laughs> um, and, and you know, it's, uh, again, I'm fine. My life is good. I feel grateful. And as an artist, on behalf of artists, I just think it's kind of, it's just really sad. And really just anyone who's doing anything, it's very sad that our creations are getting 
someone else paid and basically increasing wealth disparity. Um, and so to come back to my little thing on that level, it's nice to just not yeah. do that and to just be with people who want to be with me. There's no other entities involved. It's just me, little five-year-old with a drawing saying, do you like this? And, <laughs> and, and the people who do get to tell me in a really direct and personal way. I know that, you know, likes and streams and all sorts of ways. There are all sorts of ways to be validated. And for me, there's something about personal validation where I can really uh, talk to the person who is being into what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. Now, outside of all that stuff, just it's just really fun. I just, yeah. my favorite part about making things is the first time the little idea appears in my head. And then there's this fun little dance as it kind of becomes real. And it's the most exciting part for me of all of it. The releasing of things, the promotion of things, the all that it's, it's all got, it's, I, I try to imbue it all with happiness and with sweetness, but there's nothing like a fresh idea. Yeah. And so that's kind of, I mean, I have a joke. I think what's my joke acronym is interdependent, <laughs> definitely excellent activity society or something like that. Um, I think that's the acronym, but I call it ideas because it's just about that. It's just about the yeah. joy of discovering an idea, sharing it in a really simple way. I don't have the pressure of if I make an idea and it's kind of weird and shit. Um, I don't have the pressure of needing the world to like it. I don't have a pressure anyone like it. I don't even know who will mm -hmm. listen to it. There's just something so lovely and freeing about that. I, I, to me, if there's a center to being an artist, it's remembering that no one else really gives a shit. Right. Like, I know you give a shit. I know people give a shit. I know, you know, people like music, but no one's going to care about my music like I care about it. It's like, no one's right. going to care about my kids like I care about my kids. You know, it's, it's a very personal thing. So I just try, if I can stay as close as I can to, I love this so much let me show it to you. Would you like to trade some money or some attention yeah. for this time and energy that I'm, this thing I'm doing? Um, and it's such a simple exchange, and that's my favorite thing about the internet. So all of my personal stuff that I do on my site is kind of how I wish the internet had turned out, which is <laughs> just... Everyone's got their own little house, you know, a little website. <laughs> we can all hang out. We can connect with each other. We can, you know, and... Uh, and not have these walled gardens of of different social networks and <laughs> you know which have really just turned into sort of propaganda rivers um and it's so sad to me and that's what happens when power gets centralized overly and so what i love about the internet is that it is decentralized if we choose to use it that way so my place is just my little island and all of that is sort of philosophical and ideological, and I get that. But the cool part is that just me, the little inner five-year-old of, of of my life, is so happy just making shit. Yeah. That's that's all. That's all I'm here to do is just just make little drawings and roll around on the ground and run around and play. Like I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I've reached this point. Like in the last like few months where I've unlocked this like creative center where I'm just recording and making music all the time. And I'm like, yeah. where was this when I was 18 and like yeah. had the time and energy to like do it all the fucking time. And not when I'm like 40 and I'm like, well, I okay, think you were probably me in the internet. <laughs> I think you were drowning in the self-consciousness that drowns many oh, 18 year olds. Right? And so <laughs> now at this age, it might be like, all right, I don't give a fuck who likes it or not. You know, so right. it's, it's, it's that freedom. And so I have tried right. to cultivate that freedom. I first felt that one of the things that I, maybe I talked about last time we talked, but I talk about it all the time, but it was a big deal to me and I, I wish it for everyone. And I was a teenager and I had this flash of realization that I really couldn't ask family and friends and anyone really if they liked what i did because there's politeness and it's so hard to know if someone you know is telling the truth or trying to be nice or whatever it is um and so i realized that i had to go within myself uh and decide 
Yeah. Is what I'm doing worth anything? Is this a worthwhile thing to be doing? I know I love it, which is still the core of it. Mm-hmm. And do I have a little spark that's worth it? And it was. It didn't have to be worth it to anyone else, but it was worth it to me, and it has helped so many times over the years where if someone is mean to me and you know says I suck or whatever, I have this little awareness, this kind of, no, I don't, I don't. I'm I'm just a creature making things and you don't have to like it, but it's not that I suck. Yeah. And which is an important thing to be able to say with some yeah. faith and not be hurt by other people. Because I've received some pretty cruel criticism over the years and <laughs> anyone who puts himself out there, I'm sure can relate. Um, and on the other side where people are like, you're the fucking best. That I don't have to get involved with that either. Yeah. I can say, thank you so much for caring about it and loving it the way I love music, but I don't have to take it on and start thinking I'm a genius because someone loves my shit, you know? Right. Um, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I love to our 18-year-old self-conscious selves and huge gratitude to at least my current self, and it sounds like a little more your current self too, Yeah, that uh, we get to... We get to just not give a fuck now. Yeah. <laughs> but I've been not giving a fuck for a while. I think if there's yeah. one if there's one thing that defines what I've done, certainly one thing that I would love for people to take with them is just give a few less fucks. Just make stuff. <laughs> yeah. Or it would be a better place. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, Last- this, is a, this is a fun question. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we can go this go wherever we want. But I... Who... What led to this conversation this time? As in, what project is this conversation uh, supposed to be affiliated with? Because <laughs> I've got so much shit going on. I just like talking to people. So who? Wh- wh- why are we here? What are we here to talk about? I think we're here to talk about the sketchbook. Oh, yay! Yeah. This this is all Casey put this together. Because Casey's the fucking best. Good. He is. He really is. No, I've just got, I've got a few different projects kind of getting released <laughs> at the same time. I'm singing in a rock band from England. Uh, oh, thanks. And I'm doing a collab with this guy, Scott. The rock band is called Sons of Alpha Centauri. And uh, this guy called Scott is uh, did a crazy kind of collaboration record with different singers. And so I'm one of the songs on that. And then, of course, Sketchbook is the, the thing that's sort of the closest to my heart because this is everything we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, these all of these songs... Well, some literally were part of the early Always New, and even the sketches, they came before Always New, and what they taught me is that I get to just release the demo that I'm in love with and see who likes it. And I'm so happy that some of my most enduring music has been this stuff that I made in in just, just like where we are right now. Yeah. Um, and it was made without the idea that I was going to release it or that anyone had to like it. Um, it was just made for me trying to explore songs when I left far and was, was trying to figure out what the fuck to do. Uh, yeah. And so the sketchbook stuff in it, 1999 through 2001 just turned out to be this incredibly expansive time in my life. Um, just really liberating uh not being in a band, so really just getting to do truly whatever the fuck I wanted. Not being on a big label, which also, you know, gave freedom because they don't have investors kind of going, yeah. we need to make you something that's a good investment. Um, and and just running around. I mean, just whew, a lot of shows, so <laughs> much. Me- it was fun to go back and go, wow, look at all of the stuff that was made in these two years. And because, you know, I would say about, 40% of what I made between 99 and 2001 is on those two vinyls. Yeah. Um, and so it was fun to even pick my favorite parts from this incredibly fertile couple of years. So I love Sketchbook. And uh, I think a lot started back then for me. And and all these years later, I, can, I think I can see its echoes in popular music, popular music now, the kind of bedroom, lo-fi, indie emo kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know a lot of people that were doing that. Certainly not in the post-hardcore uh, scene, emo yeah. scene. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, it's really cool to look back on it with the with the gift of time and reflection. 
Yeah, what do you think about it these days? Uh, sketchbook or just in- yeah, sketchbook. Yeah, what do you think about uh, that material? What do you think about that approach? What do you think? What do you think? I I enjoy it. I so it's funny. I was thinking about this earlier. I came to online drawing. I had a friend from Tulsa who moved out here for a few years and we connected and we would just share music and mm. one line drawing was one of the bands he really liked or acts. And he was like, you would like this. And I did. And then I was like, <laughs> Oh, it's Jonah from far. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> um, listening to the sketchbook stuff is yeah. really cool because yeah, it does kind of take it back to that stripped down. Like, Reminds me in the same way of like hearing like dashboard confessional for the first time. I remember seeing Chris at a church for like two dozen people and you're just like, and then that dude was on MTV and you're just like, okay, like we made it. The hardcore scene made it, right? (laughs) Yeah. Chris is really, he was the Jimmy Eat World is really the band I think that made it over the wall ultimately. But Chris was, and Chris, I know, I'm pretty sure the even the idea of dashboard confessional was had something to do with one line drawing. Yeah. Um, and I know that he was really influenced by far and also by the, the early one line drawing stuff. And, um, and so it was cool to see him go to these different places. And uh, I, I still, I remain, I mean, he just sang on a, a song on my last record. And yeah. so I still have a lot of love for Chris and I'm, I'm so happy he's doing good. And that was an exciting time that, that vagrant tour where it started out, I think alkaline tree was headlining or something by the end dashboard yeah. was headlining it. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was an interesting time in life, but uh, yes, exactly. That's yeah, that, that it was a really sweet time um, for uh, apparently rock singers to leave their bands and do <laughs> weird little solo things. <laughs> yeah. But I think with Sketchbook, there's like a, I don't know, a, a fragility and a, a uh, what's the word? Not gentleness isn't quite the right word, but like something pure about the songs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, innocence is not a bad thing. Um, there's, there's a playfulness, there's a, an irreverence, there's a sloppiness. Um, that I just, yeah, I cherish even more listening. I actually just got, actually, the thing, this, the, the thing that my microphone is hooked into right now, if I can get it towards the camera, <laughs> is this little digital four track. Okay. Um, and a four track is, you know, of course, way back in the 1800s is when I first uh, got into home recording was there was, it was literally cassette four track machines and they yeah. were just so liberating. And so this one having a digital four track is such a nice return the, the latest, the latest always new ideas stuff that I did uh, is on this four track. And it's so fun to be back. Yeah. I mean, I can bounce tracks and stuff, but there's and there's a click track in it too it's a fucking cool gadget um so i can make things in this that then could be translated into the grid and then played with that way um in in pro tools or logic or whatever people do um but the feeling of just a four track is fucking cool because there's a sloppiness a messiness that comes to it where everything can't be fixed perfectly like it is now in the digital age and um so it's sort of this weird limbo between analog and digital it's all digital of course yeah but it's got an analog feel <laughs> yes. yeah yeah and the I, mean, sc- I-, and I think the sketchbook stuff has that it yeah. was and and in fact that was actually right on the edge some of the sketchbook stuff is recorded onto tape and some of it is recorded onto digital and it depends sort of where i was and what was happening um as in who i was with i forget if the rival school split stuff was recorded to tape or to computer um there's yeah there's really a lot of interesting stuff some of it was recorded on this eight track digital thing a korg d8 i believe it was maybe um that i didn't have the money to buy so it was kind of a thing back in the day to go to guitar center and to go and to buy something but know that i could return it within 30 days um so sort of it's like a rental a free rental thing (laughs) um so i went and got this pricey then digital eight track thing and recorded a bunch of the sketchy stuff just to experiment with a new way of recording you know which is just its own creative thing anyway yeah yeah from leaving far to to working on this solo material like 
was there something you had to unlock as a writer being outside of a band setting? No, I mean, the whole thing, for better and for worse, Far was on purpose. I was looking for a loud, dynamic rock band who wanted a weird singer, like a songwriter singer. And they luckily were looking for not a typical rock singer. Now, you know, our differences, I think, are what in the end broke us up. And also, I think those that juxtaposition of sort of riff rock that isn't really thinking about a song or a melody or, or a, mm-hmm. anything except a sound um, and a feeling mixed with songwriter stuff, which is much less about in some ways the sound and the feeling and much more about the lyrics, the the sort of the more subtle elements of the composition. And it's not to say one's better than the other, but they're very different practices. And I wanted to, I wanted to be, uh, who, you know, I, I wanted to be Sinead O'Connor <laughs> joining Led Zeppelin, you know, like, I, I like, like I wanted to, to have that. Um, yeah. That feeling, this real intimacy with these huge bits, which really I could just say I wanted to be like Zeppelin in the sense that they were a hard rock band that inspired all of us because they had super heavy shit, then super acoustic shit, then s- kind of playful stuff, then really dark. Um, and so I adore that thing in music. Any artist mm-hmm. that fucks around like that, um, that's what... I was chasing in far. And then when there wasn't far, yeah, it, I didn't have the tools around me to make all that noise and mm-hmm. to record music that loud and that big. It, it can be done with a boom box, but it doesn't sound very good. You kind of need a studio to get things balanced. So many things going on and so much volume, but alone there's a real freedom in not needing to, tackle the logistics of a recording and more just focus on the structure of a recording. So I was the same exact creature in far as I was and am in one line drawing and in new end original and in gratitude and in Kimura and in eyes another it's really, it's all just me. And that was actually the whole, that's actually why I came back to the name one line drawing after so many years I started you know, in far and then, I, but I had already released a solo cassette, Jonas yeah. Ons Matranga cassette, uh, a couple of them really. And so I was still doing that songwriterly thing. So when far ended, I just kind of went back to that, but I wanted a pseudonym. So I chose one line drawing. And then when I got kind of tired of that and the scene started being more commercialized, mm-hmm. I ditched that and just played under my name. But then years later, I realized that the cool thing about one line drawing in a lot of ways was that the whole idea is a one line drawing is when you start drawing and you don't pick up the pencil till you're done. Mm -hmm. And so what the noise that comes out doesn't matter. It's just a, it's just a doodle that kind of is continuing and continuing and I'm not picking up the pencil because I'm not done yet. Um, So yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a really interesting, I love a band and I, hate the logistics of a band yeah (laughs) yeah because last time you were on here we spent the brunt of that conversation talking about tender wild we didn't really talk about your background so what was the moment where you knew like i want to make music for the rest of my life Mm. or i want to try to pursue being a musician yeah the that kind of never happened okay um I never, I still don't know whether I will be a musician for the rest of my life. I I think I'll always love music and I'll probably always love singing. It's a beautiful physical act. Um, And the sound of guitar and the feel of guitar in my hands is really lovely. So I think I'll always enjoy that. And I was not one of those people that had the lightning bolt of like, this is what I have to do to make my life worthwhile. Um... I could have easily ended up a teacher or an activist or a lawyer or a, any number of things or some yeah. combination <laughs> of all those things. Um, and a lot of what I think I've tried to do in music, I think has much more to do with communication than 
a particular form of communication. As in, if I were a photographer, I wouldn't be surprised if I were doing photography in a similar way that I'm doing my music life. And if I, no, my, if I were a lawyer, I'd probably still have figured out some idiosyncratic, slightly off the grid way to do it. So I think that's what I'm interested in the most. That's what I will be for the rest of my life. I think is someone who enjoys being on the margins and playing with limitation and, uh, keeping my expenses really low so that I have a lot of freedom as far as not needing to make a ton of money to exist. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all very interesting to me. And music is the shape that that ended up taking for my, my adult life. And it's the only job I've ever had. And I feel really, really lucky about that. And yeah, it, um, I would say if there was a turning point, it was simply, I kind of dared myself in 90, two or three i had a car and i could sell it for four thousand dollars and i did the math and that would basically let me exist for about a year in sacramento at that time my rent was 140 bucks a month and so if i had four grand i was kind of rich for a year um and which is insane right and so i sold the car just saying this is going to give me a little pile of cash that I then get to spend down while I focus on music. Mm. And I figured if I can work out a way within this year, if I can start sort of understanding how a sustainable life might be had by music, um, then maybe I'll keep going. And if, if I hadn't figured out a way that year to kind of make a little money, yeah, I probably would have stopped because I really believed and I still believe if I'm free and I'm doing what I love and the world is reacting to that enough to keep me going, then cool, let's keep going. And if I'm doing what I love and I'm free and all that and I'm, and the world isn't trading money for my time and my energy, then I might want to consider something else to do. Yeah. And so that was my attitude. And so it wasn't... And then right after that happened, when I just discovered I could make it sort of sustainable, then I discovered I was going to be a father. And then there was a whole other level to it. And I told the FAR guys, hey, I can't do this on this amount of money. I've got a kid and I was raised really, really, really fucking poor. And I did not want to have that happen for my daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't need to be rich, but I I didn't want her to live in squalor or to live worried or stressed. Mm -hmm. And... So that's, and that's when we got the record deal. Um, So there were these little lily pads almost that were, I took them as green lights from the world. Yeah. um, To kind of go ahead and keep going. But it was never this thing of like, I must do this or I will die. Yeah. Uh, Music means more than I could possibly say and has been an emotional release for me, a way of interacting with the world and processing the world and all of it that I could never, ever express how important it is to me. And that's different than the identity of being a performing artist for mm-hmm. money. Yeah. That's a really different thing. Um, so the joy of music, I'm sure it will always be with me. Yeah. It's a beautiful language. And the part about being a professional, in fact, I would, I, <laughs> I joke about it, but it's true. I just, I've had a kind of a goal the whole time to not be a professional ever. (laughs) Um, Because I think it just, there's something that goes along with that that would suggest more of a, I don't know what, um, a commitment to some sort of etiquette or something like that, that I'm just not interested in. Uh, I don't think much of clothing. I don't think much of a lot of the decisions we've made as human beings. I like thinking of myself as an animal. So this is just the most fun I can figure out how to have. And it's, it wasn't that at one point I decided this is the most fun I'm ever going to have. I keep going every morning. I wake up and I go, huh, it's the most fun I could have, like finishing these songs and doing this interview. And, uh, you know, and, and as long as it stays the most fun thing I can think of to do, um, then I'll do it. And so that's, I think, I think that's, I think I've wanted to keep that perspective and never want to, to be so committed to something that I'm not 
being open to what else might be out there for me. We were dancing on tile It was cold, I was barefoot It was her TV show It was our celebration It's criminal to let these things go Light coming in Like windows on airplanes It was church afternoon We were ready for Let's talk about your relationship with Iodine. How'd you meet Casey and uh, when you decided to release Tender Wild with Iodine, how'd that come up? How'd that work I out? Met, yeah, I met Casey in the early aughts, probably around the time I was releasing the sketchy EPs and running around... Uh, doing all sorts of crazy DIY shit. And so he had a show in his basement in Alston, I believe it was. And me and Steve Caven and Travis Piebald were playing, if I remember correctly. And the basement was packed with lovely East Coast people. And it smelled a lot like cat piss. (laughs) Um, and that's what I remember about it. And I remember Casey just being a lovely human Mm -hmm. and then we just lost touch. We just kind of, I didn't, you know, um, and I knew I'd heard, I heard of iodine back then because they kind of, you know, they got some shit going in the early aughts. Um, it was, it was a real thing. And then I think we're similar creatures, Casey and I, because I think we both at some point hit a, hit a a, a limit of how professional we wanted to be or something. And so, I know that I kind of drifted away from that, and so did Casey. And, you know, his his journey is his journey. But, long story short, in something around 2020, uh, he got in touch. And he said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about getting iodine going again, and I always wanted to do something with you, or something to that effect. And I, unbeknownst to him, was already making a bunch of music, Uh, on my own as I was wont to do and just did a little crowdfunding thing. And, um, and then that turned into a real therapeutic thing over COVID where I got to communicate with friends remotely and, you know, Jeremy from new end and gratitude and uh, recorded it with me, but he lives in Minneapolis. So we were, we were working away and Norman from new end uh, was in on it. Um, So there was already a thing happening And so when Casey called me, it felt very serendipitous. And I was like, well, shit, man, let me send you these tunes that we're working on. Um, And so there was actually an independent, a really DIY release of that record, that music. And then about a year later, uh, the the iodine release came out and we changed the album artwork and the name of the record and all that. Um, And that wasn't, it had never been released publicly basically before. It was released in a crowdfunding thing that technically was public, but it was really like the ideas, like the website thing we're talking about. This yeah. is just like me and my people doing a thing. Yeah. Um, and iodine was more, huh, okay, let's see, let's see what the rest of the world thinks about this. And Casey was so lovely, and I just think Tender Wild came out just beautifully. Um, mm-hmm. And I couldn't have been happier with the way it was working with him and speaking with him about our ideas about what it was to release music and make money from it and all that stuff. And really it's sort of like being in a band. Hmm. I love, I love a label in the sense that I have people to help out and I hate the logistics of a label where it's like always, you know, waiting on someone and someone else does this and there's some technical thing. And so the way I do it with Casey is so personal and so sweet that it just feels like a very natural interactive thing. And so it was a, and even he with sketchbook, I was 
Oh, no, there was a guy in Europe, this guy, Matthias, who runs a label called 30-something Records in Germany, done some great reissues and all kinds of lovely stuff over the past bunch of years. And he had reached out saying he wanted to repress the sketchy EPs. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Yeah, let's do that. It's, I always have fun doing stuff with Matthias. And then I mentioned that to Casey, and he had some ideas that just broadened it. He kind of reminded me in a healthy, sweet way to take it a little bit more seriously. Um, <laughs> and he wanted me to, he kind of challenged me to go, what are your, forget about the sketches alone. What are, what's your favorite music that you released? Mm -hmm. um, and so how it turned out is that sketchy one and sketchy two are the first two sides of this double LP thing. Uh, and I love that. And then, the next record has some of Sketchy 3 stuff, but Sketchy 3 actually didn't come out till 2005 or something. So it wasn't technically a part of this. So I kind of reframed how I was looking at all this music. And that was all because of Casey. He said, take this period of time really seriously. This was a time you'd left your band. You were making music that in some ways turned out to be as influential as Far ever was in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and he reminded me of that. I kind of, I tended to think of my solo, my early solo stuff is so haphazard. How could it be worth uh, being important or whatever? Mm -hmm. And it's not like we tried to do some big pomp and circumstance thing with Sketchbook, but he really, one conversation with him changed the arc of the release of the music. And then we just had so much fun. We got in Jeff Gameface to do the art and that was such a lovely thing because Game Face was, you know, around back in the day. So yep. it just felt like this community of people who had survived this whole <laughs> thing of, because, you know, early aughts, none of this had blown up yet. I mean, yep. um, Bleed American and the Vagrant Tour are the, f are the two kind of moments when this right. when when this little... Things started to change. And yeah, post-hardcore indie emo thing was starting to really turn into a thing. There were bands that sounded a lot like Far, getting a lot more popular than Far ever was, because um, that music was starting to make sense to people. And then the, yeah, the more the more emo thing, and by emo, what I mean is music <laughs> that covered sort of more emotions than like sadness and anger and yeah. toughness, um, and also had a little bit more of a sloppy thing to it, and a little bit more of a melodic thing to it. Uh, and so, with that very broad definition, it was, you know, at the time, you know, grunge was fucking huge. Um, and it kind of opened a door. And arena rock was dying and dead. And so there was a sort of weird vacuum. And so we existed in this strange bubble for a while. And then the early aughts is when everything took off. And I would say that's great. And I feel happy about that. And it wasn't something I was really interested in. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind. I think I wouldn't mind the whole world knowing some songs of mine. That would be really satisfying and lovely. And to see someone in fucking India singing a t melody of mine, that would be cool. Someone knowing who I am in India, that does not interest me as much. Um, I don't mind if the music travels. I guess it gets go, won't go wherever it wants to. But my image and likeness, um, I was never that interested in being the subject of conversation. And these days, fucking Christ, I definitely don't want to be the subject of it now. <laughs> I just, it just, I don't want to be again a product for the for the fucking social network mill to, right, right. you know, I, I'm not interested in that. Uh, so, so anyway. I, I, this it sounds like I keep getting off topic, but it's all to say that Casey went on a journey like that himself. I think iodine mm -hmm. got pretty big, and then it got too much for him in whatever way. And so we both were coming back to this idea of trying to release things a bit more broadly into the world without overdoing it and without getting back into that stressful place that doesn't it just doesn't feel fun for me. And I think yeah. he f feels the same way. So. He, he really, Sketchbook wouldn't have happened without him. Um, and I feel really, really grateful for his presence in my life. Yeah. It seems like because of COVID, 
in just talking to people, there's this like a lot of people coming back to get into their roots of why they love doing something in the first place, be it music, yes. art, photography, like and I'm listening to a lot of cassette tapes because there's some joy in holding this physical thing and just like the warble and hiss of cassette. It like it speaks to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, there's joy at just creating and making things and like you there's just to- something about it. Here's my equation that I will offer to anyone who wants it. Um, and this applies across all the things, but it's about scale. Hmm. But the, the the way I like to express it is if I think of a, you know, or, you know, anyone, anyone out there listening and watching, imagine a concert. So, and the concert is there because, you know, an artist is playing. So people want to see that artist play. So the artist goes to a place, and the people who know about that artist and know they love that artist's music, they go and they see it. And let's say that's 10 people who know about this artist. As the show gets bigger, and as the artist gets more popular, there will be more people there. And inherently, the larger that event gets, the larger that little, there's the artist, there's the audience, the larger the audience gets, inherently, at some point, there are people who just see a crowd gathered, and they want to go see what's going on. And, or they might know that their friend likes this artist, and they don't know what it is, but they're going to go. So there's, it gets inherently less connected as it grows. And now big, big, big shows can have these beautiful sing-alongs and moments of connection, and there's something lovely about big shows. Yeah. I'm not saying they're better or worse, but that feeling of focus on the actual intent of the gathering, and this could be a political rally, it could be a concert, it could be anything. The bigger it gets, inherently speaking, the higher the percentage of people there will be not there for the initial purpose of the gathering. They will be there because it's a gathering or it's a scene. And that's a really different feeling. Yeah. Than the other way. And that's so that's why I love small scaled things because I can be more assured that the people who are there are there because they're interested in what's actually happening, which in this case is the these ideas that I'm making. Yeah. And I don't not everyone needs to be in love with what I'm doing. I'm just saying that it's a different thing if there's a thousand people in a room and there's the core two hundred and then the other 800 are some iteration of like heard about it from a friend looked cool heard about it on the radio you know, whatever it is you know and it just drifts back to like someone who just knows the dude who fucking runs the venue you know yeah. like and they're just hanging out back by the bar it's fine that they're there and i hope that we fall in love and are friends forever but it can turn into a thing where that's how you get these incredibly beautiful quiet artists playing in a in an auditorium and it's fucking noisy. Yeah. Um, I remember I played a place called Hotel Cafe in LA. It's a cool little spot that's also kind of hip for celebrities to come through sometimes. So I had done a little set and I was noticing it was a little noisier than usual and there was a little more buzzy. And I heard that John Mayer was going to come in and do like a cool set. And um, people had found out about it. So they were, they were coming to see what was going to happen. Yeah. And so... Not only for me was it a perfect example of like there were people, the room was more crowded, but it was crowded with people who were waiting for something else. They were not there for me, which is fine. But then I went back in and to the room and like when John Mayer was playing, the guy that everyone was waiting for, and it was still super fucking chatty and noisy. (laughs) And... I just thought it was so ironic. Here's this really popular artist. He wants to go and do this quiet show. And he yeah. literally can't do that anymore because the buzz gets out. And now he's a product. and He's a thing. And so yeah. everyone wants to be at the thing. That's how you get kids saying, I was at that show in 97. And the artist is like, yeah, there were six people there. And you weren't one of them. Like, so it's just <laughs> people love, love to say they were there. Mm-hmm. And so the, the John Mayer part of the night was really filled more, it seemed like, with people interested in being there and being seen there right they take then listening to his chorus listening to his words listening to his you know what he wanted to say in between songs god forbid um so it it was i just felt like god i'm the lucky one i know that he has so much success and money and all the things but 
I was the one that got to play in a relatively quiet room. And if, frankly, if it weren't for his buzzy ass fucking it up, it would have been a really nice show, you know? So like, <laughs> so, so it's, uh, yeah, it's different choices. It's, it's what's, and again, I don't, the things that so many artists who I once played with, I didn't play with John Mayer in the early days. I did play with, you know, Chris opened for me, Chris Dashboard, Frank Turner opened for me. I played shows with Jimmy Eat World when, you know, neither of our bands were particularly popular. Um, we we're sort of popular, but not like his, you know, Jimmy Eat World's got now. Yeah. Um, and they, I know Deftones have gone on to have so much success. Yeah. And I don't take for granted all of the things that they have gotten for that success, the money and the, that kind of freedom and the stability and all of it. And I just, the things that I experienced as scale got bigger, as money scale, as audience scale, as industry scale got bigger, I just didn't like it. And I didn't like who I was in it either. I don't think my best self comes out when mm -hmm. there's a lot of, yeah, pressure and noise in the room and stuff. It's not, I'm not really interested in that yeah sketchbook is out now digitally vinyls coming out one variant's already sold out what's your plans for this year you got more music you're releasing just continue to truck on you're gonna hit the road yeah or? man um i'm really excited i cannot wait to see the sketchy vinyl um a beautiful tin cans reissue just came out that i really love it's a real joy having shit that i made 20 30 years ago like people caring about it still. And this goes back to the thing of like, none of this was ever very popular. <laughs> so the fact that many years later, people are curious about it. It's just so, it's so beautiful. I can't even say thank you enough to the world for that. But so, yeah, uh, that's happening. Yeah. I, I leave on Saturday. I don't know when this is coming out. So this might mean nothing to anyone. Um, <laughs> When does this come out? When is this go going up? What do we got? I, like, I've, I've, I've no idea. I've not. Okay, great. So I yeah, so th this won't matter. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll, I, 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 I'm playing South by Southwest, um, which is fun, and playing another show in San Antonio, and I haven't done that in forever. In May, I'm going to do some dates near Chicago, and then some West Coast stuff. Uh, in June, I think I'm doing some East Coast stuff. None of it's really planned out. Um but it, there are little dots happening, and the sketchy vinyl drops at some point in within that, and I'm so yeah. psyched to see it and share it, and yeah, and it's really sweet to talk to you about it, man. Thank you for, I mean, I've said this a lot for a long time to, you know, back in the 90s and aughts, you would have been a zine, you know? You would have been a cool little fucking Xerox right, right. zine. <laughs> yeah. You know, you wouldn't have been Rolling Stone. You'd be a little zine. Yep. And I always have loved that zines exist, I think hmm. you and what you do are just as important to this whole little world we've got as I am. Cause I think the people who again, find your little zine are there for a pretty particular reason, not yeah. because it's a cool hip thing. And I enjoy that. So thanks for talking yeah. Yeah. and doing yeah. what you do. I'm better than nothing, and nothing is better. I'm better than nothing, and nothing is better than this. I'm better than nothing, and nothing is better. I'm better than nothing, and nothing is better than this. And I hope that fades out in everyone's brain. I'm better than nothing, and nothing is better than this. Anytime you're feeling too cool for the world or really judgmental about the world, sing that. Anytime you're feeling so fucking sad about the world and less than everybody else, sing that. I'm better than nothing and nothing is better than this. Than this. Than this. Than this. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks for listening to As the Story Grows. Our intro music was written and composed by Jeremy Hunt. The As the Story Grows theme is by Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe wherever you get your podcast and give us a rating and review. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can join us at patreon.com slash as the story grows. Be a part of our community and join the ongoing conversation over on Discord. If you enjoy this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening. I never felt so young and alive as when I'm diving into a tomb. And now I'm learning as I listen along, and the wheels are turning, and I started a song. What good word, and I'm gone. Oh, as the story. Oh, right.
attacking him. Never.